Were the Pilgrims and Puritans really the same? Did witches die by fire? Did the Founding Fathers all sign the Declaration together? Colonial America is often remembered through stories we've all heard in school. Bold declarations, stern Puritans, and iconic moments frozen in time. But what if much of what we think we know is wrong? Hey everyone, welcome back to Compelling History. Today we'll be debunking six common myths about colonial America that people still believe to this day. From when the Declaration of Independence was signed, hint it wasn't the 4th of July, to the reality of the Salem Witch Trials. Make sure you stick around until the end to improve your understanding of this time in American history. If you're new here, we release videos every week exploring different events, places, or people from throughout history. Make sure you give this video a thumbs up if you enjoy it, and make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on our future videos. Now, with all of that out of the way, let's get into the video. Does a signature on a document create a new nation overnight? For many Americans, July 4th, 1776 symbolizes freedom, but to the soldiers on the front lines and diplomats in tense negotiations, it marked just one step in a long, uncertain journey toward independence. It's a warm summer day in Philadelphia. The Second Continental Congress has convened, tensions are high, and anticipation fills the air. On July 4th, 1776, the Declaration of Independence is adopted, and voila, America is born, or so we're told. In reality, independence was far from immediate. First, let's correct the timeline. Congress declared independence on July 2, 1776 by approving a resolution by Richard Henry Lee. John Adams even predicted July 2nd would become the celebrated date. So why July 4th? That's when the Declaration's final text was approved. But contrary to popular belief, no one signed it that day. Most delegates didn't add their signatures until August 2nd, and some even later. The famous image of the Founding Fathers signing in unison. Pure fiction. The signing didn't free the colonies from British rule. Independence wasn't recognized until the Treaty of Paris in 1783, after years of bloody conflict and the pivotal intervention of French forces. At the time of the Declaration, the Continental Congress struggled to unite the colonies. The Continental Army faced dire odds, and Britain dismissed the notion of American sovereignty entirely. So why does July 4th endure? The Declaration became a rallying cry during the war, uniting colonists under shared ideals of liberty. Over time, celebrations and tradition enshrined July 4th as the nation's birthday. But here's the kicker, independence wasn't secured with ink, but with muskets, cannons, and unyielding resolve. Understanding the full story, the delays, debates, and battles makes America's struggle for independence all the more remarkable. When you think of the Salem Witch Trials, do you picture blazing pyres and burning witches? It's a vivid image, but it's far from accurate. The Salem Witch Trials, which gripped colonial Massachusetts in 1692, were horrifying enough without the myth of burning victims at the stake. Over 200 people were accused of witchcraft, and 20 were executed. 19 victims, 14 women, and 5 men were hanged at Gallows Hill, and one man, Giles Corey, was pressed to death under heavy stones after refusing to plead. Despite popular belief, no one was burned. This misconception likely stems from European witch trials, where burning at the stake was a disturbingly common punishment. Between the 15th and 18th centuries, approximately 50,000 people were executed for witchcraft in Europe. Medieval law codes, such as the Holy Roman Empire's Constitutio Criminalis Carolina, mandated burning for malevolent witchcraft. In some cases, bodies were burned post-execution to prevent supposed sorcery, but many victims endured an agonizing death in the flames. In contrast, Salem's trials adhered to English legal traditions, which reserved burning for crimes like treason. Hanging was the standard punishment for witchcraft, as seen in the Salem executions. However, what made Salem unique was its reliance on spectral evidence, the claim that a witch's spirit could harm others. This unprovable accusation became the cornerstone of many convictions. The tragedy of Salem lay not in fiery executions, but in the fear, suspicion, and social rejection that fueled the hysteria. Most of the accused were women marginalized in Puritan society, their supposed witchcraft scapegoated for broader community anxieties. 
These events spiraled far beyond Salem, with nearly 200 people accused across New England before the panic subsided. By separating fact from fiction, we uncover the deeper lessons of Salem, how unchecked fear and superstition can lead to devastating injustices. The real story of Salem is compelling enough without the embellishment of burning witches, a myth rooted in distant European horrors rather than colonial American reality. The Pilgrims had Plymouth, the Puritans had Massachusetts Bay, but their stories, motives, and lifestyles couldn't have been more different. When we think of colonial settlers, it's easy to blur the lines between Pilgrims and Puritans. Both groups are often portrayed as solemn, devout pioneers carving out a religious existence in the New World. But that overlap is misleading. The Pilgrims were radical separatists who sought to completely sever ties with the Church of England, believing it was irredeemably corrupt. Worshipping in secret under threat of persecution, they first fled to the Netherlands but later decided to establish their own colony in the New World. In 1620, just over 100 settlers aboard the Mayflower founded Plymouth Colony, envisioning a community built entirely around their interpretation of scripture. The Puritans, arriving a decade later in 1630, had a different mission. Non-separating reformers, they sought to purify the Church of England by eliminating lingering Catholic practices while remaining within the Church. Led by John Winthrop, over 1,000 settlers established the Massachusetts Bay Colony, aiming to create a city upon a hill that would inspire reform in England. The confusion likely arises from their shared emphasis on religion and geographic proximity, but their approaches diverged sharply. Pilgrims valued simplicity and spiritual independence, while Puritans prioritized strict order and societal conformity. Even their clothing differed. The Pilgrims wore colorful, practical attire, not the stereotypical black hats and buckled shoes often associated with both groups. Over time, these distinctions became blurred in popular memory. The term Pilgrims wasn't even used in their time, it emerged in the 1800s along with romanticized stories of thanksgiving and manifest destiny, concepts more aligned with Puritan ambitions. By appreciating these differences, we gain a clearer picture of colonial America and the diverse legacies of its early settlers. Their motivations and beliefs, though distinct, collectively shaped the foundation of a new nation. While cotton plantations dominate the imagery of American slavery, they weren't the whole story. Enslaved people worked in northern shipyards, homes, and farms long before the Civil War. It's a common misconception that slavery in colonial America was only a southern institution. In truth, slavery was integral to the economies of all 13 colonies. In the north, enslaved individuals labored in shipyards, ironworks, and on small farms. Northern ports like Boston and New York City were hubs for the transatlantic slave trade, and many merchants grew wealthy exporting goods produced by enslaved labor, such as tobacco and indigo. By the mid-18th century, New York City had one of the largest urban enslaved populations in the colonies. Enslaved individuals worked as domestic servants, skilled artisans, and farm laborers. The institution was entrenched, though less expansive than in the South, the myth of a free North versus a slaveholding South emerged after the American Revolution, as northern states began gradually abolishing slavery. However, abolition was a slow process. New York didn't fully abolish slavery until 1827, and Connecticut followed in 1848. During this time, northern industries continued to profit from slavery, relying on cotton from the South to fuel textile mills and using banks and shipping companies tied to the slave trade. Slavery wasn't just a Southern story. It was woven into the fabric of colonial society, shaping economies and industries across all regions. Recognizing this broad scope allows us to better understand its legacy today. The Puritans are often celebrated as champions of religious freedom, but their vision of freedom came with a catch. It only applied if you shared their beliefs. The myth that the Puritans fled England to escape religious persecution and establish a tolerant society has endured for centuries. But to understand why it's misleading, we need to examine both their motives and their actions in the New World. In England, the Puritans were a faction within the Church of England who sought to purify it of practices they deemed too Catholic. Beginning in the 16th century, the Puritan movement grew out of dissatisfaction with the Church of England's lack of reform following Queen Elizabeth's 1559 settlement. 
Religious tensions intensified under Archbishop Laud, whose harsh measures against dissenting Protestants prompted many Puritans to flee England. Yet their migration to the New World was not driven by a desire for broad religious freedom. Rather, they sought the liberty to impose their Calvinist-inspired theology, rooted in the works of John Calvin on tightly controlled communities. When they arrived in New England, the Puritans quickly established an oppressive theocracy. While they contested the crown's religious uniformity, their own vision left no room for dissent. Religious disagreements, even within their ranks, were swiftly punished. Roger Williams, a proponent of true separation of church and state, was exiled in 1635 for challenging their authority and advocating fair treatment of indigenous peoples. Anne Hutchinson was expelled merely for holding meetings to discuss spiritual matters, and Quakers who returned to Massachusetts after being banished were executed. Four were hanged in Boston between 1659 and 1661. So where did the myth of Puritan tolerance come from? Much of it can be attributed to 19th century efforts to romanticize early American history. The Puritans, initially defined by strict theological principles and missionary zeal, were rebranded as symbols of perseverance and liberty, fitting neatly into a narrative that underscored America's identity as a defender of freedom. This myth conveniently glossed over their intolerance and the stark differences between their vision and the separation of church and state enshrined in the U.S. Constitution. In truth, the Puritans' city upon a hill was an experiment in religious uniformity and social control, not an early iteration of modern liberty. Revisiting this history reminds us that the freedoms we value today were not inherited from them but achieved, in spite of their rigid practices. Their legacy is a cautionary tale of how noble ideals can be twisted to justify oppression. Picture the iconic scene. All the founding fathers gathered in one room, pens poised, ready to sign the Declaration of Independence in a single dramatic moment. It's a powerful image, but history tells a much messier story. The truth? The signing didn't happen in a single moment of patriotic harmony. In fact, most of the founding fathers weren't even in the same room on July 4th, 1776. Here's what really happened. On July 4th, the Continental Congress officially adopted the final text of the Declaration of Independence, but the document itself wasn't signed that day. The engrossed copy, the one we recognize today, wasn't even prepared until weeks later. Most delegates didn't gather to sign it until August 2nd, 1776. Even then, not everyone signed right away. New York's delegates had to wait for authorization from their home assembly, which didn't arrive until July 9th. Others, like Elbridge Gerry, Lewis Morris, and Thomas McKean, signed even later. Some signers, including Matthew Thornton, didn't join Congress until months after independence was declared. By the time Thornton added his name in November, there was no room next to the other New Hampshire delegates, so he signed at the end of the document. And not everyone signed at all. Robert R. Livingston and John Dickinson abstained for reasons ranging from opposition to independence to logistical absence. So why the myth? John Trumbull's famous painting, which hangs in the Capitol Rotunda, deserves much of the credit or blame. Despite its popularity, the painting doesn't depict the signing of the Declaration. Instead, it shows the draft being presented to Congress for approval. Painted years later, it took significant artistic license, and even contemporaries worried it would mislead viewers. Samuel Adams Wells, the grandson of founding father Sam Adams, lamented to Thomas Jefferson that Trumbull's painting might obscure the history of the event. In reality, the process of signing was just as complex and deliberate as the debates that preceded it. Delegates wrestled with questions of independence, faced logistical delays, and took the monumental step of putting their lives on the line when they finally signed. It wasn't a single grand moment, but a series of small, courageous acts. While the myth simplifies history, the truth is far more inspiring. It's a reminder that independence wasn't just declared. It was built, debated, and defended over months of careful effort. Thank you so much for watching our video debunking six common myths about colonial America. We hope you enjoyed this video and are looking forward to more videos from us. Let us know in the comments below if you have any suggestions on videos you'd like to see covered. Did you believe any of these common myths about colonial America? What are some other myths about this time have you had debunked? Let us know in the comments.
Before you go, make sure you like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video and want to see more history-related content.